Hi there and welcome to episode 26 of Ask Paul Kirtley. Welcome, welcome to episode 26 of Ask Paul Kirtley. Now, I'm here in the south of England, in Sussex, in case you're wondering about the backdrop, those of you that are watching the video rather than listening to the podcast, the backdrop I've got here is just our staff area at one of our base camps in the area where we run our bushcraft training programs at Frontier Bushcraft. We've got several thousand acres here that we, uh, we, that we run courses on, and it's quite varied in terms of the terrain, um, everything from sweet chestnut coppice, which I'm sat in here, and the bluebells are only just starting to come out now. Um, it's been quite cold this year. Um, certainly April has been quite cold. Um, and as you travel across the estate here, across the land that we've got access to, the soil varies from heavy clay through to quite land light sandy soils and so we've got a whole range of different tree and plant species here as well. A few nice little river and stream valleys in amongst all of that, quite rich environments for, for tree and plant identification as well. So it's a great place for us to be running uh, training courses and that's what I've been doing for the past couple of weeks. Um, we had a one day bushcraft and survival foundation course a couple of weeks ago, then we ran an elementary program um, with a very wet week. Um, great bunch of guys on that course as I said in the previous episode, uh, Ask Paul Kirtley 25, that I ran just after that course had finished. Um, I, I recorded that just after that had finished and put that out last week. Hopefully you've seen that already. Um, and we had a very, very wet week. Last week, by contrast, was much nicer, uh, drier, sunnier, but still cold. I mean, we're nearly in May now, and for the south of England, it's been cold. Um, everyone went home last night. Um, I stayed here on my own last night. And just as I was going to bed, it was about one or two degrees Celsius as I went to bed. It was forecast for there to be a frost this morning, but a bit of cloud came in overnight. It was a little bit warmer this morning than, than forecast and it wasn't frosty, but we've had some heavy dews and frosts in the past week or so. And it's really quite chilly still for uh, with, with being within a week of May really. So um, I'm still quite dressed here I've still got my beanie on I've got my fleece on but it's been great to be out for a couple of weeks with a great bunch of people on the different programs they've got a lot out of those those courses um, and if you're interested in any of my courses they're all available all the details available at frontierbushcraft.com also while we're on the subject of frontierbushcraft.com a few of you have been asking about the kettles which are featured in some of my videos I mentioned one is a competition a, a while back uh, also sometimes they've been just in camp next to where I've been um, there's one on the fire behind me they're under the Kirtley kettles brand you can find them at kirtleykettles.com and you can click on the buy link from there and go through to the different sizes that takes you through to the frontierbushcraft.com shop um, I don't mean to be overly salesy but a few people have messaged me recently who found the podcast and then as a result found Ask Paul Kirtley as a whole and then found my blog and found Frontier just quite tenuously they say you should you should make it clearer that those things are available because people um, that like camping out with campfires and doing the things that I talk about like those things so make more of it so yeah check out kirtleykettles.com and you will find the kettles there the range of different kettles which are great for putting over a campfire um, or on a firebox or on a stove they're really really good for that which is why which is why we sell them and we use them on the courses as well all the time and they last a long time they get a bit abused on our courses we have a lot of people using them week in week out um, maybe that aren't so familiar with uh, using kettles that are heated over a campfire and used to all the modern appliances at home um, they they stand up to a lot of use so uh, we, we like them a lot they're really good made in south africa um, so anyway, without further ado, let's get on to the questions. I've just been through my question list, which remains quite long. So apologies if I haven't got to your question yet. Um, I keep trying to get through one of these episodes a week now with five or six or seven questions on each episode. But clearly, um, 
I'm getting more questions than that a week, so I have to try and be selective and give a wide range of different answers that are uh, interesting to people. Also, I'm getting questions that are um, have been answered already or very similar questions have been answered already. Um, and I don't mind that, but please go back and look at the previous episodes. And also just bear in mind, if you're asking a question or a question that's very, very similar to one that's been asked before, I'm less likely to answer it because I want to really try and address as many new concepts and as new areas as possible for people. So without any more introduction, let's get on to the questions. I've tried to get a few speak pipe questions in this week as well, because I know there've been a few speak pipe questions um, waiting. Um, and apologies if that's been a while that you've been waiting. The first one is from Caleb English. And this is from relatively recently. I'll just bring that one up. Just need to bring the audio player up. Here we go. Hi, Paul. My name is Caleb. I am from Illinois in the United States. Um, and I've just finished watching all of your Ask Paul Kirtley episodes. And I just want to thank you for um, putting those out there. I really enjoy listening to them. I listen to them when I'm driving to work. Um, but I wanted to ask you a question on bow drill and friction fire making. I hear a lot of people, um, instructors, survival, survival instructors over here and bushcraft instructors saying that bow drill fires are only, um, 40% effective. Um, they're not repeatable. They, they, it almost sounds like they look down on, on bow drill and friction fires as a primary way to make, make fire, but I just feel like that conflicts with um, history. The Native Americans used friction fire. They must have used that every day to make their fires. And how could they have done that if it was really that difficult? Is this a, a, um, a problem with them not having enough skill? What is possible? What skill level is possible? to to be able to reach with bojo fire making can it be done under any circumstances um in any in environment can is what are the limitations to that type of fire making thank you for uh, your help on this question well that's a great question um caleb thank you for asking that and it's nice to have a question about skills that also relates to natural materials um, that's what is at the heart of bushcraft as i've said on multiple occasions before and i'll keep banging that drum so bow drill um i haven't seen the particular comment or heard or read the particular comment or range of comments that you are referring to Caleb but I've seen and heard and read similar comments before from people and I, I do first off I'll say that if somebody's saying about a technique that has reliably been used in the past um, for, for living skills for wilderness living um, if people are referring to that as unrealistic or unreliable or uh, irrelevant in today's world then that speaks to me it speaks about their skill level and their knowledge level more than it does about the technique um, so you're right to put it in the context of historical uh, use um, if we're talking about North America in particular we know for a fact because it's within recorded history we know for a fact that native peoples in North America used friction fire lighting to light their fires. We know this for a fact. They didn't have matches, um, they didn't have flint and steels until uh, Western Europeans arrived in North America. They, the native people didn't have access to tempered steels, they didn't have axe heads, they didn't have 
uh, steel, knives, um, those were materials that we brought with us and traded with the native people. So prior to that, they may have been using flint and or similar stones with things like iron pyrites, for example, um, for sparks. But other than that, um, friction would have factored highly. And we know that they were using friction fire lighting. Um, there are sets in the Smithsonian Institute in the United States. Um, we know that they're using it. Um, it's recorded. Otis T. Mason um, and I haven't done a lot of research on this before answering this question. I literally li listened to this question just before the show. I've just listened to it again. This is stuff that I know in my head. Otis T. Mason. Um, look up his books. They're quite expensive. He catalogued a lot of things for the Smithsonian Institute. And in one of his books, um, I'm, I'm blanking on the title of which one it is, there's a great section on friction fire lighting amongst Native American peoples and items that are in the Smithsonian Institute. And there are, and there are bow drill sets there. Um, so anybody that's teaching um, bushcraft or survival in the United States, particularly in the context of the North Woods um, and, and further north, um, should know these things. They should have that historical context. They should know their subject. Also, um, what we know is that um, even within the woodcraft and camping movement, um, people talked about friction fire lighting as something that was used, and that was very much centered on North America. Um, and out of that came the scouting movement and Baden-Powell. Um, those guys um, knew that friction fire lighting was viable. Um, so it, it is. Um, what we also know generally about friction fire lighting is that it is the most widely applicable method of friction fire lighting. Um, you have the most mechanical advantage of any of the friction fire lighting methods. You've separated out the downward pressure um, function with the rotational function. That is applied separately. You've got a great degree of control. You've got a lot of a mechanical advantage with the way that the set is created with the string rotating the, the spindle. Um, you can use a wide range of different uh, woods for that both here in northern Europe and in North America uh, and that's before you travel more widely where it wasn't uh, it certainly hasn't been documented as being used so much in places where um, maybe fire plow or hand drill was used more by native peoples um, you can still apply it in those places um, but in the cold damp wet parts of North America um, it is recorded as having been used it was even used by the Inuit um, and there were modifications to the bow drill half that you need to make for using it on snow so that it's wider, it catches the ember directly on the hearth. But again, those sets are in museums. They have been collected. Not ones that have been recreated recently, but ones that were being used in situ and collected by anthropologists um, and taken back to places like the Smithsonian Institute. So we know this, that people were relying on it. And that's even within the time that other methods of fire lighting were available to them. Before that, it would have been even more important to the native people. So yeah, um, it is definitely in that context very, very important. Also, um, it stands to reason if they were using it uh, regularly, that it was reliable. Um, now, this, this is where it comes down to the individual that's using it. The set on itself is not gonna light your fire. It's down to you using it. Um, and certainly, anecdotally, um, we've used bow drill a lot in the UK and Northern Europe, um, as well as North America, and it works reliable, reliably as long as you have um, the requisite skill level. And I, and I have to say, when I first um, was taught bow drill, I was very, very hit and miss with, with bow drill. Um, I learnt bow drill on a course, uh, I was shown the technique on a course of 16 years ago and I did not achieve an ember on that course. It was a very wet week, um, even the instructors struggled to get an ember on that course, they did eventually, but it was a very wet and damp week. Um, I made a set, I got the basis of the, the body position and the coordination to do it, but I didn't achieve an ember that week. And it was some time after that course, having made a couple more sets and tried and failed, that I finally achieved an ember. And after that, I then proceeded to make um, my ember creation more consistent. But even when I started instructing, there was a few occasions on courses when it was extremely wet, um, 
you know, really had been either raining very, very recently before the demonstration or even during the demonstration where I failed to achieve an ember and I had to come back um, often having worn the spindle down to a point where um, I needed to make a new one, I had to go and make another spindle and come back and do it again until I achieved an ember. Sometimes it can be quite difficult given the conditions, um, but it's also down to your skill level. Going back to those same conditions again now, I'm, I'm certainly more confident that I would um, have achieved an ember because I've done um, bow drill demonstrations in similar conditions since then and achieved an ember um, each and every time. Also. Um, some of the people who work for me have practiced a, a lot and I'm talking about spoons in particular. Um, anybody who's seen spoons do bow drill wouldn't want to bet against him getting a, an ember and that's just doing it solo. Um, then you come onto the concept of people doing uh, bow drill tandem and, and realistically unless I was on my own if I needed to rely upon uh, bow drill to light a fire I would do it in tandem with somebody else and that's perfectly viable to have them help you even if they've never seen the technique before because all they need to do is get on the other end of the bow and give it a little bit of extra oomph and you've effectively doubled the manpower um, on that set um, and certainly myself or one of the instructors who works for me um, with a, an, an inexperienced person on the other end will achieve an ember without too much difficulty um, with the right sort of wood. So then we need to also have a knowledge of materials but as I say it's a very very widely applicable technique. Um, in this environment, Northern Temperate, we don't know if it was used for sure by our ancestors because it doesn't, you know, parts of bow drill sets don't really persist in the archaeological record. And there are a few things um, that might have been bow drill spindles that, you know, that are in the archaeological record, but nobody's quite sure, nobody really wants to say. And also, I think there's an issue with archaeologists not being familiar with the technique. Um, you know, it, it, an archaeologist can only interpret what they know about, and if they're not familiar with how to make a bow drill set really well, and they're not as familiar with um, bow drill as say I am or spoons is, then they're not going to be able to interpret that stuff as well. So again, you've got that problem of interpretation with archaeology. No disrespect to the archaeologists, but um, uh, they they need to understand the the the, uh, the context. Um, Otherwise, they're limited by their own experience, unless they bring in other outside experts. So, basically, we don't know if it was used here, but we use it all the time. Um, every single week, we're running courses, we're doing bow drill demonstrations, we go and gather the materials. It's not stuff we've had in a, in a shed somewhere warming and drying. We'll go and gather the materials, we'll make a set and we'll make fire. And that's something that's extremely reliable as long as you have the requisite skill. And the, and the skill comes down to practice both in terms of muscle memory and specific fitness, um, as well as the skill in making the set. So making it finely, making sure that all the parts that will make a big difference in whether or not it works are made properly and all the dimensions are correct. And then also material selection, both in terms of the species, as well as the condition of the materials. And that all comes down to experience. So what I'm saying is, the, the, the bow drill technique is as reliable as the amount of time and effort you've put into learning it. So if somebody turns around to me and says bow drill's only 40% reliable, I'd say you need to practice more. And I'd, be, I'd happily say that to their face. Now, clearly there might be specific instances where, you know, there are very, very limited species available in a particular environment um, and therefore it's less likely that you're going to find any sort of species that might work for bow drill and therefore um, the, the reliability of it in that environment is less. I understand that. Um, but otherwise, if there is a species of wood or, or, or liana or something that you can make that's woody that you can make um, a bow drill set out of, even in places that are relatively um, devoid of trees, you can make bow drill sets from juniper and juniper is the most widely distributed woody plant in the northern hemisphere if not the world. It's right around the northern hemisphere, it's native to both North America and um, Eurasia 
uh, that is, and you can actually get the tinder from the bark as well. It's in the Cypress family, Cupressaceae. They have those fibrous barks like um, uh, those of you that are familiar with cedars, like um, the white, uh, Western red cedar and Eastern white cedar, fibrous outer barks. Juniper has a fibrous outer bark as well, which you can make the tinder bundle from as well. So you can make all the parts of a bow drill set pretty much from a, from a juniper uh, bush or shrub, as long as you've got a woody enough part for the, for the hearth and the spindle. Um, so there are very few places that are, have any shrubs or trees that you can't find something to make a bow drill set out of, um, at least the friction parts. One of the limita limitations though is the cordage. Um, that's your real limiting factor. Um, doing bow drill, and we talked about this a few episodes ago, I think it was the one when I was sat in the snow, um, doing bow drill with natural cordage is very difficult. Um, and by natural cordage, I mean plant fibers. Um, the natural cordage that works extremely well, actually better than um, nylon cordage, better than paracord, is rawhide. If you've got a rawhide thong, that is an excellent material for, for bow drill. And, and in fact, that's what the native North Americans used. They either used it uh, strung across a bow, as we might use bow drill, but also they used it as a thong with two toggles on the end made of antler or bone. And then one person held the spindle in place with a top block, with a bearing block, and the other person did the, the spinning using the thong wrapped around once like so. That again, two people make it viable. So the thing to carry is to carry the cordage, carry a rawhide thong or carry a length of paracord. Replace your boots, uh, boot laces with paracord, for example. Um, people wear paracord bracelets, that's fine. Personally, I'm not a huge fan of them. Uh, that's a different discussion, but just make sure you've got some paracord on you. Um, replace the, replace the uh, drawstrings in your kit with paracord, you know, your sleeping bag, the top of your rucksack, those sorts of things. If you replace all of those things with paracord, you've always got paracord, even if you've forgotten to put a hank in your pocket. Um, if your laces have got paracord on them, if you've got a paracord bracelet, um, you're always going to have paracord on you so you can then make a bow drill set you need a cutting tool um, of course um, and making a bow drill set without a cutting tool is hard um, romantic people will say well i'll just pick up some flint there are very very few places where flint is just kicking around on the surface you're not going to go and find flint or obsidian or something and be able to make a bow drill set that's the thing that's going to be hard to find not the materials to make the bow drill set so the thing to make sure you always have on you is a knife even as even a swiss army knife or a small folding knife you can make a bow drill set with um, and then people will say well why don't you just carry a fire steel well, true, and if you've done bow drill a lot, you'll understand the value of carrying a fire steel, um, a Swedish fire steel or a ferro rod or whatever you want to call it, or a cigarette lighter or matches or all three. But I still don't think it precludes the relevance uh, and the importance of learning bow drill because it makes every single part of your fire lighting skill set from whether you start with a small glowing ember or to a small flame to an established fire it makes every single part of that process better everyone that i know that can do bow drill consistently is very good at lighting a fire in any condition using a cigarette lighter using uh, matches using a fire steel using a flint and steel because they can take the most uh, there's the smallest of embers and achieve a flame even in difficult conditions. People who just use matches and fire steels all the time are generally poorer, much poorer at lighting fires and managing fires than people who have a greater level of knowledge of all the different methods of fire lighting. That's just experience. And that's just experience of taking something that's very, very tenuous to a fire. Now we've done bow drill demonstrations in, um, the, the worst conditions I remember in the last co couple of years is we do a two day bushcraft essentials course. And on that course, on the second day, we cover bow drill. And we do it as a group activity. So we do it as a two or three people working together to achieve, uh, to make a bow drill set and then to achieve fire. And we do a demonstration of that first. And a couple of years ago, I think it was the year before last, um, we had a course, it had been nice all weekend and then it rained on the Saturday and we had a thunderstorm on the, on the, on the Sunday afternoon, um, the, the second day, 
Um, and um, literally, as we're about to do this demonstration, it, the, 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 it got dark, it got that horrible sickly green color that you get with uh, thunderstorms sometimes, the, the heavens opened, we were in, we sort of got ourselves into a, 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 an area of quite dense spruce, but it was still coming down. And what we did was just one of the guys took their um, waterproof jackets off, held it over where um, the bow drill demonstration was done. Two people on the bow drill to get the ember, somebody else, a fourth person, held the, uh, the tinder and kept it dry and then took uh, the, uh, the ember to the tinder underneath the, the jacket. Um, all the other pieces were um, ready to go, small sticks ready to go, snapped off the spruce trees. Um, the bow drill set had been collected nearby. There was a stream nearby that had willow growing near to it. So the willow had been collected right there and then. Um, the small sticks had been collected right there and then. Um, everything for the fire was prepared there and they created an ember. This, this was a couple of guys who worked for me, created an ember, put the ember into the tinder bundle, the bird's nest, blew that into flame and lit a fire in the rain, in a thunderstorm, in torrential rain. The guy who'd taken his jacket off got a bit wet, but then we had a big fire and he got dry next to the fire. So personally, I think it's, as long as you've got the materials and you've got the skill, it's viable um, as a very reliable technique under just about any conditions. Now, if I was on my own, or if any of those guys were on their own in those conditions, it would be harder to achieve that because you're, all, you're one person on the bow, um, and also just maintaining um, cover and um, making sure the tinder stays dry and every stage is kept dry in the rain is harder when it's just one person. Having a tarp clearly or a polythene bag to put over the top of you while you did it would make a big, big difference. But again, you could create, and we've done it, sticks, four sticks, put your waterproof jacket over the top and work underneath it um, to provide some sort of rain cover for the set. That works. Is, is perfectly possible, but it goes back to having made bow drill sets from lots and lots of different materials. You understand how willow works, how sycamore works, how field maple works, how horse chestnut works, how juniper works, how hazel works, how birch works, how scotch pine works, how um, the different firs work. You, you understand that it's not worth trying with oak or sweet chestnut or hornbeam or um, uh, or beach, for example. You know the ones that work, you know the ones that don't work, you've tried them so many times that you understand the condition they need to be in to work, you know how to make a set of the dimensions that are going to work most efficiently for you and your body and everybody's different and you've done it enough to have confidence in the technique. That's the thing, if you set out without confidence, you'll probably fail. If you set out with confidence, you'll probably succeed. That makes a massive difference. So what's up there is important and in your skill and your experience is massively important. So my, my, my advice would be just go out and practice a lot. Practice, 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 practice. Practice with materials from the woods. Don't practice with materials that have been stored and seasoned in your garage for, for months because they'd be much drier than what you'll find out in the woods. Practice with materials you find in the woods, practice in different conditions, practice in the winter, practice in the spring, practice in the fall, um, in damp conditions, in cold conditions, and you will make that technique your own. Um, you will own it and nobody can take that away from you. And so don't let anybody tell you that it's not a viable technique. Um, but equally, um, you, as you become to appreciate the technique, you'll also understand the value of carrying other methods of fire lighting as well. And I don't think anybody really, really, truly appreciates the, the, the modern methods of fire lighting until they've mastered the bow drill. I haven't mastered the bow drill yet. Um, I'm still working on it. There's the species of tree that I haven't tried it with yet. Um, there's conditions in which I haven't, uh, you know, I haven't been up to the high Arctic, for example, where the Inuit use it um, or used to use it. Um, I've not tried it in those conditions. Um, I'd like to one day, um, but in terms of northern temperate, um, it's a completely viable technique. In terms of boreal, it's a, it's a viable technique. Um, and certainly in the tropics and further south, um, it's a viable technique as well, even though we don't necessarily know that it was used there. Um, and certainly in your neck of the woods, um, so to speak, in Illinois, absolutely. Go out there, research the materials that are, um, that are viable for the technique in your area and practice and practice and practice and practice and make it your own. And you'll put those people that say it's not viable to shame and all power to your elbow. Take care, cheers. Next question, that was a long answer, but it was 
a very important discussion because I hear a lot of bull crap talked by people about how useful these techniques are. But just the last thing on that, on bow drill actually, um, don't think because you've gone and done a course and achieved an ember with a particular set, with a particular species that you can then just go out and always light fire. You need to practice a lot. Um, so on the elementary course the other week, it was quite wet and people, we had just about everyone achieve an ember in the course of that week. Some people were a little bit slower than others. Um, and some of, some, of the, uh, some of the people who struggled a bit it was down to the set that they'd made so they need to go back and refine the process of making the set they were strong enough they had good technique but the sets weren't quite good enough so they have to go back and make a better set but don't think even once you've got an ember with a bow drill that now that's sorted you've mastered it i hear people say that oh yeah i've got an ember i've mastered it no you haven't you've achieved an ember you've achieved one fire and and you still then also have to master the process of taking the ember to flame with lots of different um tinders um, you know, you can't just have one snapshot, one data point, one type of wood with one set under one set of conditions with one set of tinder and say you've mastered it. That's just bullshit. Yeah, you need to um, practice, 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 practice. And if you're not prepared to do that, then you're not going to get good at it. Um, these things take time. Um, they really do. Okay, quick question here. Um, this is from uh, John Lendon. And John asks um, about him and his grandson. He said his and, he and his grandson love going out in the woods. Um, his grandson's three. Do you think it's too young to do an overnight? Well, no, I don't because um, kids are just as capable of sleeping outdoors as um, adults. I think the thing you need to be careful of with kids is that they get colder quicker. Um, and more easily than adults do. The, the, the surface area to volume ratio of their bodies is different. Um, their body systems are not as developed as an adult's in, in their prime. And those two things um, mean that they get colder quicker. So you need to make sure he's going to be wrapped up warm. Um, even, even now, you know, it's quite warm during the day on a sunny day at this time of year but at night it's really quite cold and it drops off. As soon as the sun goes down, it drops off. Um, summer months would probably be the best time to, to start him off. And um, you know, you've got relatively short nights, you've got longer days, um, you can tire him out during the day and he'll get him to bed and uh, he'll probably sleep quite well, but you need to make sure he's wrapped up nice and warm. You've got plenty of stuff to make him comfortable. Bring his favorite, you know, if he's got a, you know, favorite teddy or a favorite toy that he normally takes to bed with him, you know, those sorts of things that kids have, make sure he's got that with him and make sure, you know, he's, he's got his own things so that he feels like, um, you know, it's, it's, it's part of a, an adventure with his things. And, and if he trusts you, then I think that will be fine. Um, maybe start off with a, a camp out in a tent and then you can, you know, if you want to take pillows and extra blankets and things, you can and make sure that you're nice and cozy um, and then progress on to sleeping outside, maybe under a tarp, which is a bit harder um, to manage a, a, a child underneath a tarp where you've got, you know, you've got bre the breeze coming across and you've got to make sure that they're wrapped up properly and the baffles are done up on sleeping bags. And some kids can find, quite, can find that quite constricting um, to be trussed up in a sleeping bag that way. Whereas at least in a, in a tent, you've got the wind cover, you've got the windproofing, you've got protection from biting insects if they're an issue. Um, you can make sure that they're covered up just as you would do at home in bed. I mean, it, it's no different to that really and if he sleeps all right at home I can't see any reason why I wouldn't sleep out all right in the tent and you can make it into a real really nice adventure and it doesn't need to be scary um, it can be a lot of fun particularly if he likes being out in the woods so I, I would say yeah the, the sooner the better get them out even if it's in the garden you know get them out in the garden first in the backyard in a tent sleeping out really enjoying it and um, make him feel comfortable with being in the tent and then maybe go a bit further afield and go out to the woods and and sleep out and make it a really fun adventure um, I, I mean certainly by the time he's five uh, you know I remember when I was five I was making dens in the garden and things and you know I didn't sleep out until a little bit later than that but I had a little um, sort of wigwam tent that, um, that I used to put up in the garden and so by the time I came to sleeping out it just didn't seem it didn't seem unusual to be outside in a tent at all so if you just introduce it gradually and you know take it 
make it very familiar to start off with and then move on from there so it becomes familiar with each stage and not just jump into a completely unfamiliar scenario and in every respect and i think it'll be absolutely fine and it'll be a lot of fun and he'll thank you for it in in later life good question as they all are they're all good questions okay next one Return of Andrew Casey. Another question. He had a birch bark question recently, but this is another one. Another uh, question. This one is more about fitness. Um, and Andrew and his friends went and did a hike uh, a while ago, and they had a very wet weekend. And he's told me I saw him recently on a course, and he told me about it. But this question predates him coming on a course with me. Um, but I haven't. I didn't answer it then, and I'll answer it now. Um, the question is. Um, I'm still finding great value and information in all of your work. Thank you again. You're yeah, very welcome, Andrew. Um, I'll keep the question as brief as possible. After a recent mini expedition in Galloway, I made a list of things to work on or rethink or that didn't work. On that list was the need to improve my general fitness, which I've, which I've started to do. So my question is this, how do you recommend keeping your fitness levels up to be trail ready? I can walk forever, but when I added my equipment on my back, seven to eight miles in the Scottish Lowlands really taxed me. Apologies if this has been asked to annoyance. Thanks, Paul. No worries, Andrew. Um, so, um, there's a couple of there's a couple of variables here, Andrew. One of them is fitness, and the other one is the weight of your kit. And, you know, so one of the areas you might want to address is the weight of your equipment for a particular purpose. Um, in general, I would say people who spend time outdoors under the umbrella of bushcraft tend to choose equipment that's a bit on the heavy side, either because they are working to a budget and they'll go for military surplus equipment, which is often very robust, but heavy. Uh, or they'll go for traditional equipment, which again is robust, made of materials that were available, the only available, only available materials in the past, such as canvas and leather, um, which can also be heavy um, compared to some modern materials. And some of those materials get heavier when they're wet as well. So bearing those things in mind, have a look at your equipment. It could be the case that you can lower the weight of your kit and certainly the backpacking that I do I look very very carefully at the weight of every single item um, and it can seem a little bit uh, pedantic or, or anal to be shaving off grams almost here and there but overall it can add up and for an example of that just look at the first um, part of my lightening the load videos where I look at sleeping equipment that's one area you can save a lot of weight. You can save kilograms of weight, um, pounds, you know, pounds and pounds of weight for those of you that are in uh, the United States. Um, you know, you can save four or five pounds on sleeping equipment without really trying at all. Um, so that's one place to start looking. Cooking equipment is another area to start looking. The cutting tools that you take, do you need all of them? I, I regularly see people who are interested in bushcraft taking multiple knives and saws and axes out with them. Um, do you really need all of those things? Because they weigh a lot. Um, so that's, those, are, those are areas to look at. Um, but that aside, in terms of fitness, what you can do is, um, first of all, you have to ask the question, fit for what? Um, fitness is a bit of a, an amorphous term. People say, I want to get fit, um, but what do you want to be fit for? And you want to be fit for hiking with a backpack. And so one way to get fit hiking with a backpack is hiking with a backpack. Um, and that's, <laughs> that sounds slightly, that's a slightly sort of silly answer in a way, but it's, it's, it's perfectly true. Um, you know, you go out for walks regularly. Um, I know that. Um, and so what you could do if you if you you know you've got a multi-day hike coming up you could increase the weight of your day pack i know it's it's it's, it's effort but you could put more weight in your day pack just to start conditioning yourself for the the, the multi-day hike and that's an easy way to integrate your training into your 
into your regular outdoor life. That's one thing that you can do. The other thing you can do is then do some specific training. And to me, the areas that you need to, to, to train are you need leg strength, you need general cardiovascular fitness, um, of course, but then you need leg strength and you need decent upper body strength, um, and particularly in your shoulders. Um, listen to the um, podcast with Chris Townsend because there's a lot of good stuff in there about hiking long distances with backpacks as well but generally yes you can walk yourself fit on longer trips but on, on a shorter trip you're not going to get to any significant fitness gain if you're going to go out for three or four or five day trip you're not going to start feeling fitter in that time it's only if you're going out for weeks and weeks you know you start off and then you'll get fitter and by week three you'll be feeling a lot fitter than week one and you see that with people walking the Appalachian Trail, Pacific Crest Trail, even um, walking the uh, Pennine Way for example in the UK um, people will feel fitter as they're doing it whereas if you're just going out for two, three, four days you won't really feel fitter you want to be fit in the first place to carry the things that you want to carry. So you can do some specific training um, go out for a walk with your backpack on. So pack all the things that you want to take on the trip with you and go out for a walk. Do one of your local walking routes that you do, do it with your backpack on. That will help the specific overall general fitness. You can then also do some exercise to, exercises to strengthen your legs. Um, whether it's gym work, you could do some um, you know, quadriceps exercises, um, you know, balance with your hamstrings, but just do, if you do some leg extensions, some um, presses with your legs on a machine or do some squats um, do some calf raises you know you will go a long way you know stuff that exercises your glutes your quads your calves balance that by strengthening your hamstrings as well or else you you'll have trouble with your knees and um, they'll help particularly on the hills and um, where you're having to you're basically having to put a weight on your back and lift it up a hill so the more more leg strength you've got the better you want a good amount of core strength and then you want some shoulder strength. So doing things like press ups and pull ups and um, uh, various exercises that strengthen um, your shoulders will, uh, you know, deltoid raises, those sorts of things will help. Um, and, you know, the military are very, very good at training people to cover distances with heavy, heavy loads. If you look at the training processes of people like the, the Royal Marines or the Parachute Regiment, you know, and you can buy books on um, their training methodologies and you can buy books on um, training regimens based on their, on their training uh, programs. Um, that you can do your own fitness programs at home. Um, that would be a good idea because basically you want to be able to do that same thing. You want to be able to carry weight over distance. So anything that allows you to do that is, is a good thing. Doing some running, um, walking up flights of stairs with your backpack on, finding a steep hill, doing hill repeat, repeats with your backpack on, um, they're all good things to do in terms of training and then doing a bit of gym work as well um, or doing some stuff at home um, in that respect is good. I always used to find cycling good as well in terms of strengthening up the quads and running good for strengthening up the, the, hamstring, um, the hamstrings and the calves um, and that combination is good for walking uh, but then you don't want to be just a little thin racing snake with no upper body strength. I'd, uh, you know, I used to do a lot of mountain bike racing and I used to have to work on upper body strength because because I didn't have enough for other things that I wanted to do from the cycling. Um, when I started doing martial arts, jiu-jitsu in particular, I, I, I improved my upper body strength. Um, but you have to concentrate on the areas and, and carrying a heavy backpack with a great deal of cardiovascular fitness and strong legs isn't enough. You need quite good upper body strength as well, even though most of the weight is on your hips most of the time. So in summary, um, I would say, Put a bit more weight in your pack when you're doing your day-to-day um, -day walks, that's one way. Um, you can do some specific training, so go for a hike with your backpack fully loaded, do that one of your, one of your local routes. You can do some specific um, strength training, so you could do some gym work, legs, upper body, um, the things that I've talked about. You can also do some specific um, training with the backpack, find a, a steep set of stairs, go up and down it repeatedly, um, 
have some rests to start off with, but then decrease the amount of rest to improve recovery time. Um, you can do uh, steep hills as well. Just find a hill that's going to take you a couple of minutes to climb with your backpack on. Start with a, a weight that you can manage um, to do, say, eight repeats without too much difficulty with maybe like a 30 second or a minute rest at, at, at the bottom. So go up, go straight back down again, 30 second rest, up, straight back down again, and then increase the weight um, progressively each week. Don't do more than one session a week and integrate that into doing other things like running and cycling. Um, uh, and, and that will get you more than fit enough to go out and do seven or eight miles with your backpack on. And as I say, check your, check your, um, check your weight as well. If you can bring your fitness up and your weight down, you'll be able to go much further um, with much less effort. And seven to eight miles isn't that far. Um, I, if I were you, I'd be aiming to be doing 14 to 20 miles a day with your backpacking kit that you can take the food at the end of the day is the heaviest stuff and if you can carry a week's worth of food and your camping kit 20 miles a day that that's a good aim for backpacking so that's what you should be aiming for if you want a name okay right so this is going to be quite a long episode today lots of good questions with relatively detailed answers next one is another speak pipe question this is from jack mccormack Good to hear from you, Jack. And this is just going to take me a second to bring up the audio player. Hi, Paul, it's Jack. Um, just thought I'd start off by saying how I absolutely love the uh, Ask Paul Kirtley series. I know I've watched every single episode so far, I'm really enjoying them. Thanks very much, they're so helpful. Um, one great question I have though is, um, my question today is going to be, it's quite a broad one, but what is your kit mentality? By that, I mean, what do you feel about primitive equipment, what do you feel about traditional equipment, and what do you feel about sort of modern day camping and mountaineering equipment? Do you use a crossover of all three within your kit? Um, and do you take some of your mentality from those who have lived before us? So, sort of, for example, Oats of the Iceman, Daniel Boone, um, Long Hunters, Native Americans, and other historical time periods such as the Sami people that we've seen. Uh, if you could get back to them, that would really be appreciated. I'd be really interested to know what you think of the equipment that those guys have used and whether it's still valid today. Thank you very much. Hope to look forward to the answer. Bye. All right, Jack. That was a little bit splashy on the uh, on the audio quality, so I'll repeat the crux of the question just in case it didn't come across very clearly. Have a sip of cold tea there. Mouth's a bit dry. Um, so the question was, what is my kit mentality? Um, what do I use? What do I think about um, modern mountaineering equipment and outdoor equipment versus traditional? kits such as canvas and leather versus primitive kits such as Oatsy the Iceman might have used um, or the equipment that various native peoples might have used. Um, well I think we probably need to make a distinction between what native peoples have used in the past has largely been what's been available to them in their environment until they've been able to trade with other people. And what you see immediately as soon as they can trade with other people is that they trade for the things that they think are most valuable. Um, in terms of traditional kit, again, it's the same. People used what was most valuable, most uh, available, but also uh, most viable for the conditions. And the same with modern mountaineering equipment. People use what works best. And it's, so if I, have a, if I have a kit mentality, it's, it's that, what, you, what works best. Um, and people are constantly trying to pin me down on equipment um, that I use and I do have a sort of core kit that I might come if I'm working on a course in the UK what do I come to the woods with I've written about that in the past there are blogs on my article uh, there are blogs uh, articles on my on my personal blog there um, I've done a video about packing that into a rucksack into a, into a relatively small rucksack and how I do that um, that isn't the only kit you can take and it's not the only way you can pack it and people misinterpret that it's just what I do under those circumstances and then I and then tr people then try to pin me down on um, 
would that work in this environment? Would that work in that environment? It, I don't know um, for, some, for some places where you are because I haven't been there. What I always do is look at where I'm going based on my experience and based on the experience of people who have been there and look at what works best for that environment. Some of that is still very, very traditional. So if I go up to the north of um, Scandinavia into the boreal forest or into the boreal forest in, in North America in winter, I will take materials that are often considered old fashioned, cotton smocks, leather boots, you know, full grain leather boots, cotton smocks, leather gloves. Um, whereas mountaineering used to use that stuff. If you look at Sherpa Tensing's and Edmund Hillary's kit and, you know, that era, there was leather, there was canvas, there were hobnail boots. But that era has passed. Material science has come a long way. And in terms of those activities, the materials have changed, just as the materials that you know, are used in space travel have changed as our knowledge has improved. The, the materials used um, for mountaineering have changed. The materials used for boats has changed over the, over the centuries and over the millennia. It's about technology at the end of the day and what's available and also what is economical. Um, you know, particularly with mountaineering, people don't want to die and they want to be able to get up and down with, uh, the, with um, minimal, not minimal effort isn't the, right, right, um, isn't the right phrase, but basically you don't want to be carting up a bunch of canvas leather and hobnail boots, um, canvas and leather rucksack, hobnail boots, uh, you know, cotton smock and all of those things. If you've got lighter weight modern materials that do the same job, um, if, you know, the same as if not better than the old materials. So, you know, you can see why there's been that development. What I see in bushcraft circles, um, uh, and again, it's a phrase that, uh, that I find uh, troublesome. Um, what I find in people that are interested in bushcraft is that there's a, this harking back to the past. And it's fine if, you, if you're into historical reenactment, fine. Choose, the, you know, choose what you use based on the, 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 the era that you want to reenact, that's fine. But personally, that's not, my, that's not my primary interest in the outdoors. My primary interest in the outdoors is spending out to, at time outdoors, going to environments, visiting environments, traveling through environments, learning about that environment. Um, the kit to an extent is secondary. I'm not that interested in kit. I'm only interested in kit to the extent that it works in keeping me warm, keeping me dry. It's not too heavy, all of those things. And so I will look to maximize my comfort and my safety in an environment and minimize the weight and minimize the maintenance and maximize the durability for the amount of time that I'm there based on, on that. So for some trips I will use, you know, canvas, cotton, furs, leather, those things because they work best. Other times I will use Gore-Tex, plastic boots, you know, it, it just depends on where you're going and what you're doing. So I don't have a kit mentality in terms of choosing an era. I've got a kit mentality in choosing what works. And it's, it's an engineering problem at the end of the day. It's like specifying what you want a rally car to do versus what you want a Formula One car to do. You can't say that one type of tire is better than another. You can't say that one type of engine is better than another. You, you, it, it's a different machine, it's a different specification. It's the same when you're doing a canoeing trip in Canada in the summer versus doing a snowshoeing trip in the winter. It's a different specification and your kit changes as a result of that. Now what works best, some of it is very traditional still because what worked in the past still works very well now. Other things we have moved on with material science and there are better options available now in terms of durability or weight or, or whatever the specification is. So it's down to being um, open-minded to what's available. So yes, um, I still strop my knife on a, uh, on a birch polypore if it's available, but equally I'll use a modern uh, stropping paste and a leather strop sometimes. It, it, it just depends, you know, the, the materials are all there. And I think one of the things about bushcraft, if we're going to bring it back to bushcraft, is that it isn't about the kit, it's about your understanding of natural materials. And your choice of equipment is largely down to environment and the aims of why you're there. Um, and so to that extent, by all means, choose 
um, old fashioned kit, choose ancient, you know, prehistoric um, kit as much as we know what people used and it was, it's still patchy in some areas, use modern equipment. Um, but you know, my favorite mountain walking jacket is not gonna be great in the woods when I'm carrying logs on my shoulders. Um, I'm gonna use a heavier duty or Gore-Tex jacket or even a, a Ventile jacket with something else underneath as I've talked about in the past. Um, I'm typically not gonna go out dressed like Oatsy. Um, that's just me. If you want to reenact that period of time, by all means do so. And, and I'm not saying that that's invalid to do that. You can gain some insight from doing that. But my, my choice of kit is really predicated on wanting to be comfortable and safe in an environment and to achieve other things. I'm not going into an environment to try and reenact anything with particular types of equipment, so I'm just going to choose what works best for that environment for the aims of my trip, which are not about the equipment. So that, that, that is a bit of a vague answer in that sense, but that is the approach that I take. As I say, the nearest thing I can say is like an engineering problem. Do we want to, you know, are we, are we driving a rally in, the for, in Hampstead Forest in the northeast of England in November, or are we driving um, a Formula One car in Monaco in the summer it, it you know it's courses for courses at the end of the day in terms of what you choose and how you uh, the design and the materials that you use and that and, and that's how it should be otherwise you're kind of being romantic um, you know I, I did a podcast recently with Mark Kelch um, uh, about making river descents and some people would be very romantic about the um, the craft that they use but what I liked about Mark and we didn't really talk about it too much in terms of uh, being romantic or not but one thing that I drew out of it was that he's used whitewater uh, river rafts he's used stand-up paddle balls he's used kayaks he chooses the he chooses the craft that suits the journey the best he's not romantic about the craft and you should be the same with all of your kit choose what works best for the environment you're going to and what you're trying to achieve there so hopefully that helps Jack And again, I will bang the drum. Bushcraft's not about kit. Bushcraft is about nature. The kit is a different question altogether. Last question, long one today. These are all long form answers. I could probably do a podcast on each of these things. Isa, <laughs> we, we haven't had a question from Isa for a little while, so uh, I thought we should put one in. I saw there was one here from him from a while ago. Let's see where we get to with this one. So Isa asks, hi Paul, what are your views on survival shows and the survival experts that feature in them? I personally only admire a few of the experts on those shows. Um, and he mentions Les Stroud, Cody London, Matt Graham, Ray Mears. Um, da -da -da -da. He says, Cody London advises people to be very cautious about survival shows because he feels that they can be very misleading and give people a false sense of security. I admire Cody and Matt because they live the primitive lifestyle and Les Stroud, Survivor Man, are about as genuine as any survival show can be. What are your thoughts on all of this? Would you ever consider making survival shows of your own? Well, my thoughts on all of this... Um, and some people will probably shoot me down in flames because I haven't been involved in any of these things, but I have talked to people who are, have been involved in these shows, both people who've been in front of the camera and both uh, and people who have been behind the camera uh, or, or been behind the scenes. And, and indeed, I've worked with a few of these people. So um, my view on, a, on, any, on any media, and remember, this, this is what we're talking about. It's media. That's what we're talking about. And we have to take a step back and take a slightly more meta view um, about why do these things exist? Why does a, why does a Discovery Channel survival show exist? Um, why does a BBC uh, documentary exist? What are the motivations that have led a group of people to come together to make that piece of media and to distribute it out to the world and to put it in, in a, out in a place where you and lots of other people are going to see it? That, is, that fundamentally tells you what the value of that piece of media is. Um, for the most part, these shows are not made for public education. They are not. They're not publicly funded. They're not made by non-profits that are trying to educate the population. They're made by organizations who are for profit and therefore that is the fundamental goal of making those shows. They're making content for their channels, 
which generate sufficiently large audiences that they can then generate revenue, either by selling that content directly to them or by generating advertising revenue. Um, that, is, that is the motivation. And it's largely about audience numbers and therefore they have to make those shows widely appealing uh, and they have to, in certain circumstances, make them somewhat uh, notorious uh, and get, get headline grabbing aspects so that they get people in to watch them. Now, can that be aligned with public education? Yeah, absolutely. Um, of course it can be. Uh, are they always uh, aligned with showing you best practices, um, showing you realistic um, elements of outdoor life? No, they're not. And there are countless examples that we could bring up and we're not going to do that now. Um, I don't think the point, is, the point is to be finger pointing. I think the point is for you, the viewer, to be aware of why these shows are being made. Um, and remember, it isn't Bear Grylls making a show. It isn't Cody London making a show. It isn't Les Stroud making a show. It's the production company making the show. Um, there is a producer, there is, a, there is some funding coming from somewhere to make those shows. They pull the strings at the end of the day. Um, so to the extent that the survival expert or the in front of camera person can show realistic techniques, and I believe Cody London um, is on the right page with those things. So I, 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 you know, I'm on the same page with him in terms of having to be careful. Um, I think he tried to do that with dual survival. Um, having spoken to him personally at the uh, Bushcraft show, um, David Scott Donald and I had a conversation with him. Um, I think he was badly done to um, by that whole situation. And at the end of the day, as I say, a lot of these shows are just made to get big audiences and to uh, generate income. Um, and that isn't always in the best interest of the viewer, unfortunately. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff that's shown is unrealistic. A lot of the stuff that's shown, um, it isn't even necessarily they're showing you the wrong things. It's just that the way that they're shown, the time, you know, the way that time is compressed by editing, um, the way that success can be shown uh, to come more easily as a, as a result of editing um, gives you a false sense of uh, how viable certain techniques are. Um, we had a conversation about bow drill. You can watch a million Discovery Channel shows that include bow drill. It won't make you really much better at all at, at applying it in reality. You have to go and practice it. Um, and so for, for people to be showing it to be easy when they have relatively low experience in those skills um, is just gives people a false sense of security. Um, you know, I, I could point holes in quite a few examples of so-called survival experts using bow drill on shows that, you know, I've seen enough beginners fail with bow drill to know when they're going to fail. And I've seen enough beginners succeed with bow drill to know when they're going to succeed. You can tell by the body positioning, how stable the, the, the drill is, how well they're bowing, if they're using the full length of the string, if we're using bow drill as an example. You watch, you know, you put a piece of television footage in front of me, I can do the same with that, or a piece of YouTube footage for that matter. You know, people sometimes send me YouTube, you know, clips to their YouTube videos saying, what do you think about what I did here? And people will say to me, it was, you know, it's amazing. It's almost like you were there. How did you know that? You know, how did you know I was cold? How did you know that I didn't get any sleep? How did you know um, that I didn't achieve it the first time with my fire lighting or whatever it is? Because I've been there myself and I've seen, you know, scores and scores and scores of students succeed and fail at certain things under um, under my supervision and you know we've trained people to get better at things and you know those stages and you you recognize the signs you can't hide it um, and and sometimes the shows try and hide failings and i think that's dangerous then we come on to these um just if we're onto the subject of survival shows as a whole then you come on to you know things where they're clearly set up to cause some sort of antagonism or drama um, you know, unrealistic scenarios. And by unrealistic, I mean, under what real circumstances would you ever end up naked in the middle of an Alabama swamp? Um, I don't know. Um, so 
you know, I have a bit of an issue with shows, you know, it's, it's entertaining and I, and I know some of the people who have been involved in Naked and Afraid, for example, and I'm not, I'm not at all criticising them for being involved. But again, um, a lot of these shows, the producers are setting them up to create titillation, to create curiosity, to create antagonism amongst the, the, the protagonists, whether it's those 10,000 10, BC shows, Naked and Afraid, uh, Dual Survival, um, uh, The Island, they're all set up for there to be some sort of drama at some point. Um, and that's the fundamental problem with them. They're, the whole scenario is based up to create drama for the entertainment of the viewer. It's not set out to, for the education of the viewer. And that's why, um, you know, I agree with Cody, you have to be extremely wary about taking any lessons from them because um, they're, they're a completely, uh, the, the motivation for them is completely different from what you're trying to take from them. You're watching them as somebody who's interested in bushcraft and survival, trying to learn from it. Um, that's not what the producers of those shows are trying to do. They're trying to entertain you. They're trying to enter, they may, they may not even be trying to entertain you because frankly, a lot of them don't entertain me. As somebody who's interested in bushcraft and survival, I just get frustrated at them and I don't watch them generally. Um, but they're trying to entertain an audience so that they can generate revenue. That is why those shows are made. They're not made to um, say, right, how do we go about educating people who really want to know these skills and really want to know how to survive on an island or really want to know how to... They're, they're not. They really aren't. Um, I don't believe they are. Um, and, you know, so maybe Les Stroud shows go, you know, more towards that. Um, Cody certainly was trying towards that. Um, Ray Mears was certainly um, under the auspices of the BBC, which is not for profit. Um, was trying to sh um, show skills from around the world in an educational way um, as well as it being entertaining but the primary thing I know because I, I worked with Ray not on the TV shows but I know he was always trying to be educational and show people things um, in a realistic way rather than just titillate people but I do feel that a lot of the shows there's too much false drama there's f too much created antagonism and there's too much um, too much stuff that tries to grab sort of headlines on th on places like BuzzFeed you know it's that kind of headline grabbing clickbait watch this show because somebody's eating poo or they're naked or they're you know going crazy with a machete or whatever it is um, and it, it's, it's, it's kind of fly on the wall, um, exploitative television at its worst in some instances. And I, and I stay away from it. So those are my views. They are my views. I'm sure some people will shoot me down in flames. Everybody's got their fans. Um, you know, you're quite welcome to have your, your, your opinions as well. Um, I'm not saying that my opinions are the only opinions about these things, but personally, do I get a lot of value from watching these shows? No. Um, do I agree with Cody that you need to be wary about drawing lessons from them and what they're trying to show? Yes, absolutely. So those are my views, Isa. Thanks for another good question. What do you think? What do you think? Let me know in the comments below this video. If you're watching on YouTube, below the video in the comments on YouTube. If you're watching on my blog, below in the comments on my blog. What do you think of the survival shows? Which ones do you think are valuable? Which ones have you gained value from? Which ones do you think are terrible? Let rip, let me know. Um, don't have a go at me just about what I said. Let me know what you think in the comments below. If you're listening to this on a podcast, there isn't, um, if you're listening directly on my blog, again, you can put comments underneath on my blog. If you're listening via iTunes or Stitcher or SoundCloud, you're gonna have to go to my blog or to YouTube and find episode 26 and leave comments underneath the video. I'm really interested to know what you all think on that matter um, and I'm sure ISA will be as well and if you've got any comments on any of the rest of the show as well today please let me know I'm always interested to see what you think I will try to reply to as many as I possibly can all right well that brings us to the end of the show um, last thing to say quite a few of you started following me on snapchat i hope you have enjoyed the things i've been sharing from the courses and the woods over the last couple of weeks um, keep 
signing up, keep saying hello, keep following me on Snapchat if you haven't done already. There will be more good stuff coming. Um, I'm gonna be back in the office for a couple of days um, doing some video editing, doing some writing, got some magazine articles to write, but then I'll be back out again in the woods and I'll be sharing some more um, stuff from the woods. I'm gonna do a tree and plant walk at some point in the next couple of weeks. I don't know exactly, it might be, Assuming this episode goes out or to later today, which is the 24th, um, it's probably going to be very early May, in the first week of May, on Snapchat. I'll do a, uh, I'll do a, um, I'll do a tree and plant walk where I'm just going to go out and I'm going to show you interesting stuff um, that I find as I go, um, where I have reception, of course. That's the downside with Snapchat. So um, I will try and let you know the date on Snapchat. In the, in the upcoming days before that so that you can so you don't miss it because of course the snapchat stuff disappears after 24 hours so you have to be on there and keeping keeping track so the first thing to do is find me on snapchat my username is paul kirtley um, add me as a friend there you'll see my story in stories you can see what's going on the stuff that i'm sharing there um, it's like a rolling video of all the things that i show photos and videos all of it's to do with the outdoors and what i do some of it's behind the scenes stuff some of it's things that go on on my courses some of it's things that go on when i'm just out and about on my own I share all of that i'm finding it a lot of fun and I've got really good feedback from the people who are already following me there. So if you're not already on there, it's not just for kids. Um, it is a really good platform that I'm really enjoying putting out some extra video content on as well. And if that's a little bit too much for you, don't forget to follow me on Instagram as well. Um, as you know, I'm a big fan of photography. I love my photography um, and I try and share at least one nice or inspiring photo on Instagram every day. So find me on Instagram. I will put the links in the uh, show notes. I'll put the links. Um, I'll put a link um, of my uh, Instagram name here as well on the video when I edit it so you can find me there straight away um, and also you've got the links from my blog at paulkirtley.co.uk as well you can get to all my social profiles from there and say hi and um, I look forward to seeing your photos as well if you're on Instagram if we connect on Instagram. All right take care and I'll see you on the next episode. Cheers, bye. <music>